All right. Good morning, everyone. Um, so we have our next first quiz next week, so a week from today. For this lecture, it will be right at the beginning of class. Um, so please try to get here before 9 AM, So you, because we'll pass out the quizzes. And then hopefully, right at 9 on the dot, you can flip them over and work. Um, yeah, that just gives us the most amount of time to take them, and so we don't have to cut in too much of the lecture. Um, if you haven't seen, I uploaded six practice quizzes to Canvas, um, so you can take a look at those. I noted the first one that I uploaded is one that I wrote last quarter. Um, and also, as I noted there, it ended up being a little trickier than I intended it um, for my class then. Um, so hopefully, you should be able to understand it with the solutions given. Um, but don't worry if it seems a little bit, I don't know, if that one was tricky for you, because it was very tricky for my class then too, and I adjusted after that. Um, the difficulty of the rest of them is sometimes maybe a little higher than I would intend. Um, I don't know, it's hard to say. The first quiz of the quarter, it's always kind of a trying to get in the right range. But my goal is not to like have everyone do horribly and then curve it up a lot. Um, I intend to like make the average what it should be for the class, somewhere around an 80. So that's my goal. The quizzes are not intended to like be terrible. Um, but we'll see. <laughs> um, any questions about the quiz? Yeah. So I, the DL, that's a good question. I have to take a look. And I'll, I'll post in a Canvas announcement exactly where in the DL. But I'll tell you in today's lecture um, at what point like the material stops for quiz one. Technically, you already have all the information you need for quiz one. So I covered in the first lecture all of the topics that will be on quiz one. It's really just Bernoulli's equation, conservation of current, like I1 equals I2, I equals AV. Like those three equations, it's really just two, um, are everything that will be on the quiz. Today's lecture, I will go over in more detail like some specific examples, um, but that is not yeah, it's not necessary. It's just more review. So you already have everything for the quiz. Most of today is going to be review for that and then topics that are new and not on the quiz. Yeah? Say, say that one more time. No. Yeah. And again, I have to check exactly about the DLs, but it's just fluid circuits with Bernoulli's equation. Um, and you can see that on the quizzes, too. All the quiz material is very, like, it's very much stuff that, that you should already be relatively comfortable with. Um, OK, so with that, uh, we'll just do a quick review of what we talked about last week. Again, this is like the bread and butter of everything that will be on the quiz. If you can apply this equation um, correctly and know what you're doing with it, that's, that's pretty much the entire content of the quiz. On the left-hand side of the Bernoulli equation, we have a bunch of terms with deltas in them. Those are evaluated just at a start and an endpoint. So the delta is your final minus initial. It does not matter what happens in between. Right? I have a pressure at point A, point B, potential energy density at point A, point B. It doesn't matter what happens if it goes up or down, if the pipe gets narrow or thick or whatever. Just what is my pressure here? What's my pressure here? What's the thickness of the pipe or the kinetic energy density here and here? Same with potential. So those are evaluated at endpoint. The terms on the right, the E pump and the minus IR, only matter for what is in between those two points that you picked. So here's my point A, here's my point B. If my pump is just before my starting point, it doesn't matter. And if like, I have some resistance just after my endpoint, it doesn't matter. Those two terms only come into play if there is a pump or resistance between the points that I picked. So that's actually kind of one of the tricky parts about the practice quiz that I posted that I wrote. Um, you can see, I don't want to spoil too much of it, but there is a start and an end point that you're evaluating this between. And there is a pump present, but that pump ends up not coming into any of your equations because it's not in between your two points. Um, so yeah, this is a representation of how to use that. Um, again, we're talking about energy density, so not energy itself, just energy per unit volume um, in a fluid circuit that is conserved throughout the circuit, as is your current. Um, and the deltas signify a change in position, because the behavior is constant in time. So this is steady state. 
So any questions on what is on this slide here? Yeah. That, so far we've treated it, and maybe you've, I can't remember whether you've not, you've had this problem DEL yet, but R we've been treating as kind of just this like constant value, like I have some section of pipe with some resistance R. Um, we'll talk about a little bit later how we actually arrive at that. Turns out if you have a pipe with resistance R and then I double the length of it, you'll probably double the resistance as well. So, um, and then we're also gonna talk about more of that later in the DL. So we'll, we'll get there. Um, any other questions about this stuff before we do some examples? So first I wanna take a look at drinking through a straw. So I'm not really asking a question here. Just wanna use Bernoulli's equation to examine what's happening. Like why does drinking through a straw work? What, you know, what's going on there? So we have a cup of water. So far pretty boring. We know that there's atmospheric pressure in the air around it. And so the pressure of the water at the surface where it meets the air has to be atmospheric pressure. We put a straw in there, still atmospheric pressure in the air and the straw, all the way through it, it doesn't matter. Right? There's still just a straw sitting in water, so the pressure at the surface is one ATM. But now what happens when we suck on the straw? We know experientially that water is going to flow up through it, so let's think about why that's gonna happen, and let's use Bernoulli's equation to do so. Well, if we're gonna use Bernoulli's equation, we need to decide what our delta is between. What is our start and our end point? So I labeled a few options up here. We have the surface of the water, which we know is at atmospheric pressure. I labeled this point in the straw that's still at the level of the surface of the water, but now we're inside the straw. I have the pressure in the mouth, so a bunch of different choices here. And also I think it's important, this is kind of a weird setup for Bernoulli's equation we haven't seen before because we're flowing from this cup into the straw. But we need to be able to visualize here the fluid circuit flows like cup then straw. It was almost like we had a wide pipe that's going into a narrow pipe. The wide pipe is the cup and then going into the straw. But in this case, the straw is within the cup, so the fluid's flowing like down and up through the straw. But this is still a continuous fluid circuit, right? We have some amount of fluid that's flowing from one, one way um, from the surface down into the straw and up to the mouth is how we can think of it. Um, so anyway, back to where do we want our starting endpoints to be? Well, if we're going to actually be able to solve this equation, we can't have more than one unknown point, right? If I'm trying to find the difference between A and B, and I don't know what A or what B is, it's going to be pretty difficult to find the pressure at either one, because I, you know, I need to start somewhere that I know, and then my, work my way, using Bernoulli's equation, to somewhere else. So why don't we use the surface, where we know what the pressure is, one ATM, as our start point, and work our way then up through the mouth. So we'll just make this whole fluid system our circuit, starting point, surface of the water, ending point, pressure at the mouth. So we're traveling from P PATM, something we know. We can investigate the changing energy density systems, potential and kinetic as we go through, and then we'll find the new pressure, the unknown pressure in the mouth. So now we know our start and end, let's apply it to Bernoulli's equation. First off, the right-hand side, in between the surface of the water and the end of the straw at the mouth, is there a pump? Nope, it's just water in a cup and a straw. And is there resistance? Well, that, we could say there is, but let's just say there's not. So we'll say it's frictionless, so we could just cross that side of the equation out. So between the surface and the mouth, all we have is changing pressure, potential energy density, and kinetic energy density. Let's take a look at potential first. Our indicator for potential energy density is height. Is there a height change between the surface of the water and the mouth? Yeah, it's whatever this delta H is. Again, it doesn't matter that we have to go down and back up, it just matters what is my starting point, what's my ending point, what's the difference between the two. So my delta PE over volume is going to be rho G delta H, we're going from the surface of the water to the mouth, so my delta H is going to be final mouth minus initial surface, and so my delta PE over volume is going to be positive. 
right? I'm going to increase my potential energy density because we're going higher up is one way to think about it. Or here, H mouth is larger than H surface, so that's a positive change. All right, so now we found the sign of our potential energy change. And I'm just doing signs, right? I'm not assigning values to anything. I just want to see what's going up, what's going down, analyzing the behavior a little more generally. So now let's look at kinetic energy density. So this one's a little trickier to see, but there is going to be a change in kinetic energy density. What's our indicator for kinetic energy density? It's the cross-sectional area of the pipe, right? Which tells us then the speed of the fluid inside it. So we're starting P surface, our cross-sectional area is the cross-sectional area of the cup, right? That's our pipe, essentially. The water is just flowing through the cup. But then it's going into the next piece of the circuit, which is this narrow straw. So our area is going from wide at the start to narrow, like a straw, at the end. So if our area is decreasing, that means the speed of the fluid is increasing. And if we wanted to write that out using our equation, we see delta Ke over volume is equal to 1 half rho delta V squared. And so I already did us the favor of substituting. We, we don't know what the velocities are, but we do know that they have the same, the current is conserved, and they have different areas. Right? So this, <laughs> this is, writing it out, I think, makes it look a little more confusing, because now we have area in the denominator of everything. But really, what, what we found intuitively is our area is decreasing, so our speed and kinetic energy are increasing from start to finish, from surface to mouth, so we're increasing kinetic energy. But if we write it out, we can see this term here, our final V, I over A, right? We have I equals A V, so V is I over A. A straw is smaller than A cup. So if the denominator here is smaller, that means this value is actually bigger. Right, so bigger minus smaller, we get a positive number. So anyway, I don't know, here, this is why I think for these types of things it's very useful to combine, like your intuition is my, just like my area is decreasing, so my kinetic energy is going up. That's much easier for me to think about than writing out this equation right at first. If I'm solving for a quiz or a problem, something like that, I'm going to have to do this, but it sure helps to know what I want my answer to be before I start writing it out. Anyway, we found our kinetic energy density also increases. So now going from surface down, th up through the straw to the mouth, we've increased both our potential energy density and our kinetic energy density. So what does that tell us? Well, our delta P now is equal, well, which is equal to the change in pressure, P mouth minus P ATM. We can ex plug that in and just kind of move it around a little bit. But basically what it's telling us is that the pressure at the mouth is equal to atmospheric pressure minus some number. And that's because we had some pressure, atmospheric, and then spent it. Some we spent it on potential energy density. Some we spent on kinetic energy density. Both of these things are growing, so our pressure has to shrink. And we end up with a pressure in the mouth that is smaller than atmospheric pressure. So we found that as we flow through our circuit, our pressure is decreasing from the start to the end. So how does that fit into why drinking from a straw works? Why does water flow up through the straw? Well, water does flow, fluid flows, and just in nature, things flow from areas of high energy density to low energy density. It's true for water, it's gonna be true for electricity, it's true for like heat. Um, but a way to maybe physically think about it is before you start sucking on the straw, you just have a straw sitting in water, air, the atmosphere is pushing down on the surface of that water in the cup, inside the straw, everywhere at one ATM, right? It's applying that pressure, which you can think of as like a force per unit area, pushing down, constant everywhere. But then when I put my mouth on the straw and suck, I reduce the pressure in the straw. So now the air is still pushing down on the water in the cup, with one atmospheric pressure, but in the straw, I decrease the pressure. So now instead of being balanced everywhere, there's less pressure where the straw is, and so the water level will rise to equilibrate, yeah. Yeah, so, 
I have this equation up top, delta P plus delta PE plus delta KE equals zero. And then here I know delta P is just my P final minus P initial. So that's P mouth minus P ATM. If I plug that in up top for delta P, then I just move everything over to this side except P mouth. So I'm saying I want to solve for P mouth. So P A negative minus P ATM comes over to this side and becomes P ATM. And then the plus these two becomes minus those two. Yep. So yeah, so there's a pressure. Now the pressure is, when I first start sucking on the straw, is not equal everywhere. And so the atmosphere kind of wins, and water flows up the straw into the mouth to an area of lower pressure. Um, so another, like there's, there's a couple like approximations we need to make here. Um, that I didn't mention so far. One, does the water level stay the same <laughs> as I start drinking from a cup? No, the second I start to drink from it, this water level is going to change. And so the inputs to our equation before will change. Then the pressure, the height difference between the surface and the mouth is going to change for one. Um, and yeah, does the, the system is not truly a steady state system because the second it starts to flow, its behavior is going to change. So that was one approximation. We can either say, this applies only when I first start drinking. This is just like at a snapshot. Another thing we could say is the water level. Maybe this is a huge cup. It's like I'm drinking from the ocean, right? In that case, the water level of the ocean, technically, if you drink from it, will change. But it's so small that you can basically ignore it. It's like an infinite reservoir. So that's one way we can get around it. Another approximation we made, no resistance. Another one we made, well, I guess we didn't really make this. We just assumed, but something we'd have to factor in if we were using numbers. The, if we were finding the areas of the two pipes, right, the cross-sectional areas of the cup and the straw, the straws would be easy. That's just like, you know, the straw looks like a pipe. Whatever its cross-sectional area is, that's what it is. But for the cup, we have whatever the cross-sectional area is of the cup, this circle that we have to find the area of. But then we have to subtract whatever the cross-sectional area of the straw would be because the pipe that we're flowing through is the cup minus what the straw is. The water is flowing down in the cup, but up in the straw. So I wouldn't ever ask you to solve something like that. I'm just meaning to point out that this example, using a very simplistic approximation approach, did a lot for us and let us kind of figure out why things happen, where the pressure is higher, where it's lower. But um, the deeper we dig, the more careful we have to be that our model isn't kind of reaching further than it can. Um, so if we want to go one step further even, now we have atmospheric pressure in the cup. We drink water. We said we create like kind of a vacuum. It's what we call also a low, like a lower pressure, a pressureless environment in our mouth. And that's why the water flows up there. But when we drink water, we don't want to pressurize our bodies, right? We don't want the water that flows into our bodies to be, well, yeah, we don't want our bodies to be a vacuum, right? Your stomach, should, you don't want to like implode. So it should get back to atmospheric pressure. How do we reconcile that? Well, if we let's think about putting a pump at the other end of our mouth. So I don't really know much about anatomy of the human mouth and throat and whatever. But basically what's happening is there's something that's acting as a pump that's forcing that when you suck is forcing your mouth to become a low pressure environment. And then it travels through something that that pump and the energy density gets increased again back to PATM. So we start at the surface at atmospheric pressure, like we said, flow through the circuit, decrease our pressure when we get to the mouth to some lower pressure, and then when we swallow, it goes through the pump and its pressure is increased back to atmospheric pressure where it's happy in our stomachs and not a vacuum. So I don't know if the mouth works like a pump, the throat works, something in this region of the head or, or throat works like a pump um, in order to get water from a cup into our mouths. Um, all right, questions about this example. This is not, I, I would not ask you to start from scratch this much for anything like on a quiz. Um, I just thought it was a fun example to try to apply this abstract stuff to it. Yeah. Sure, yeah, it would change the height. Um, also, friction does come into play. Like there's no true frictionless pipe, so the longer the straw, like we mentioned before, you'd probably get more friction. You could try, if you have a, a bendy straw, 
that's a good, that's a good example for this. You have like a curly Q straw that's really, really long. It might not be that tall, right, because it's all wrapped up, but it still might be very hard to drink through because it's a really long pipe, has a lot of resistance. But that's something we'll, we'll talk about in maybe the next lecture. All right, so let's do a few clicker questions. Um, on this example here, so this is, I wouldn't call it a brain teaser, but there is an extra step that you have to do. Now instead of, these, are, these water levels on the bottom are acting as pressure gauges, right? We have air flowing through a pipe on the top. Now instead of us having pressure gauges be like standpipes, where water rises above them to indicate the pressure, we have air flowing through the top and the water in the bottom is acting as a pressure gauge. Instead of the water being pushed up, the air is pushing down on the water. So this water in the bottom acts as a pressure gauge between uh, the pipe that we have here. And the key that I'm telling you is there is resistance in this pipe. So air is flowing from left to right. There is resistance in this top pipe. So let's start. How does the water level in one compare to the water level in three? So I'll open the clicker poll. Encourage you to use it. And if, at least if you're not going to, try to answer the question for yourself. It's not graded or anything. Um, it's just a good check-in for me and for you. Give you about 15 more seconds. All right, I'm going to stop us there. So let's write out Bernoulli's equation between 1 and 3. So we're just looking at the top pipe right now. Remember, we have a few fluid systems here. Um, well, we have the air in the top and then the water in the bottom. Anyway, between 1 and 3, we certainly have a pressure difference. Well, we're trying to figure out if there is a pressure difference. Is there a potential energy density difference? No, they're at the same height, so no difference there. And kinetic energy difference, no. They have the same area, cross-sectional area, one and three. It doesn't matter that the pipe gets narrower for two because it widens back out at three, and we only care about our endpoints. Then on the other side, there's no pump in between them, but, I'm, but we told you that there is resistance. So we just have this change in pressure is equal to minus IR. So the pressure from one to three should decrease. And if the pressure decreases, unlike with the standpipes, fluid in a standpipe, we're going to have a higher water level in the one with the lower pressure. Because if three has a lower pressure than one, it means three is not pushing down as hard on that water column as one is. So three will have a higher water level. One is pushing down harder, so it will win, and H1 will be smaller. So that's that, just that little extra step that you have to do with this. Once we find out that the pressure is greater in one, we have to realize that means that the height of the water underneath it is going to be lower. OK, let's try. How does the water level in one compare to the water level in two? And feel free to chat with your neighbors about these if you want. We're work alone. Whatever you feel like gives you the best practice. A few more seconds. All right, I'm going to stop us there. So for this one, we have an added term to our Bernoulli equation. Now 
we do have a change in area, right? The area goes from wide to more narrow. So if the area is decreasing, we know the speed, and so the kinetic energy of the air has to increase. So now we have our pressure difference plus a positive change in kinetic energy density equals a uh, negative value here. So if we were to move this positive value over to this side, it'd be negative, and so our pressure difference is equal to minus IR minus this. In other words, we lost some, pre some poten not potential, we lost some energy density to dissipation from friction, and we spent some on kinetic energy density because our speed increased, so our pressure definitely has to decrease from one to two. And so same thing before, if two has a lower pressure than one, then the height of the water level in two is going to be higher because two isn't pushing down on it as hard. All right, last one, let's compare two and three. Ten, fifteen more seconds. And I know sometimes I rush these. The idea here is, well, obviously to move on with the lecture, but it's okay if you feel a little rushed and you didn't get to finish it. I think it's good practice to have a little bit of problem solving pressure in a case where it truly does not matter at all. Um, like I said, they're not graded. I don't even look at them um, any time after right now. Okay, so pressure difference between two and three. Let's write out our Bernoulli equation. Change in pressure. We do have a change in kinetic energy density, right? Except that this time the pipe goes from narrow to wider. So the speed is going to decrease and our kinetic energy term is going to be negative. And then we also have this dissipation. So now we have delta P plus some negative value equals a negative value. In other words, we can move this over here and we have a minus and a plus on this side. So we are getting some energy back from kinetic energy density, because that's decreasing. So we're getting some energy density back, but then we're also spending some, or losing it, to thermal energy dissipation, to friction. So we actually can't tell what the height difference is gonna be between two and three. It depends how much energy density we get back from kinetics, so just depends on how much the area of the pipe changes in relation to what the resistance of the pipe is. So to summarize what we just said, between one and two, we know the pressure is definitely going to decrease, so the height in one has to be lower than two, because one's pushing down harder than two is, and then let's say we just make an assumption that resistance is very small, so going from two to three, we'll just say resistance is small compared to the change in energy, uh, kinetic energy density. And so in that case, our change between two and three would be we have that uh, increase in energy density. We get it back from kinetic. Kinetic energy density is decreasing. So minus a decrease, we get a plus for our pressure and a minus for dissipation. But again, if we say that's small, our pressure should increase in which case the height for three should be lower than two. If the areas of the pipe, cross-sectional areas were very close to each other, almost the same, and resistance was very high, then this resistance term would win, and we'd have a decrease in pressure, in which case the height in three would be higher than the height in two. Um, but yeah, we weren't given enough information, so we had to make the assumption. Questions about this example, or any three of these? This is the last piece of this lecture that is, I mean, I won't say is relevant to your quiz, like stuff later on, understanding deeper might just make you more comfortable with all of this, but this is the last slide that has material that you would be responsible for on the quiz next week. 
So again, like this isn't really anything new from last lecture, it's just more complex examples. The cup thing is not something I would expect you to reproduce, it was just, but still, it helps solidify these concepts. Um, so from here on out, we're moving on, um, stuff that will not be on the quiz. Okay, so we talked a lot about changes throughout a circuit from point A to point B. What happens, and I, I've used the word circuit a bunch, what happens if we actually go all the way through a circuit? So we've just been looking at these snapshots, and they could be, uh, we, don't, we don't know what's on the other end. It could be something that completes a loop somewhere. It could be just going from like one reservoir somewhere else. We've just been looking at little sections. So what if we have a whole loop that we can go around? Well, we're just gonna change our, not, not change our notation, but maybe add to it a little bit. We're gonna call the left-hand side of the Bernoulli equation the total head. That's just our, our budget. That's what we've been talking about as our budget, the pressure that we can spend on kinetic energy density, spend on potential energy density, get back. It's conserved unless we add energy density or take it away with a pump or resistance. The right-hand side, the only change I made is add this little summation just because we can have multiple pumps. We can have multiple resistances. So this sigma with whatever's inside it, we're just saying add those all up. So if I have multiple pumps, add them together. If I have multiple resistances, add them together. And so what this lets us do is make a concise expression for when we're using Bernoulli's equation, like I said, all the way around a circuit in a loop. If we go in a loop, that means our start and our end point are the same. So my whole left side, the delta head, remember pressure, kinetic energy density, and potential energy density are all just deltas between my start and my finish, if my start and my finish are the same, then all three of those terms are zero, right? My total, my delta total head is zero anytime I go around in a closed loop. So that's a really powerful result for when we're dealing with full circuits is that when we go in a loop, I only need to balance out the energy density that was added to it by external things like a pump and taken away from resistance. Um, so in this case, you know, we go through this pump here from P1 to P2, we get an increase in pressure, and then I go around back to P1. I need to have the same answer. You know, P1 can't be different depending on how many times I go through the loop. There's, it's one point in space, there can only be one pressure there. So I have to lose in resistance through this circuit whatever I gain from the pump. So we write that out, it's called the loop rule, but I mean it's really just applying a specific scenario of Bernoulli's equation where the total head equals zero. Anytime I go in a loop, my, total, my delta total head is zero. Again, you could just write out the whole Bernoulli's equation and you'll just see though that my final and initial are all the same values. So we get that. Uh, the right side of the equation, in this case, if I have the circuit shown, there is a pump and I do have resistance in the pipe, so my final equation is just zero equals E pump over volume minus IR. If we want, we can solve for the current in this case, and we see it's just the energy density given by the pump divided by the resistance, which kind of makes sense here if we have a circuit and we want to investigate the current going through it. If I have a stronger pump in the numerator, that means I'll have more current, and if I have more resistance in the denominator, that will decrease the current, which kind of makes sense. We want to how much fluid per second is flowing through the circuit. I think that's pretty intuitive. So now this gets to the question about combining resistances and like lengthening them and stuff like that. Um, so far we've pretty much just had a value R. This is my resistance for this circuit. What if I kind of localized it and add multiple resistances to it, right? Now let's say I have this fluid circuit, we have water flowing around clockwise here, and now we'll say any of the thick area of the pipe has no resistance except these two segments here. This segment labeled R1 has a resistance R1, and this segment labeled R2 has a resistance R2. So now let's try our loop rule, or really just Bernoulli's equation applied in a loop. Um, so we still, I mean, and now we don't, we get our starting and ending point are the same point, but we still need to pick where that is. Um, it doesn't matter, you'll get the same answer no matter what, but let's pick four. So we start at point four, 
Going clockwise, we go through the pump, so we get this E pump over volume term. Then we keep going, nothing, nothing, nothing. Then we go through the segment with resistance R1, so we get a minus I R1. Then this little segment, then we go through R2. So we get a minus I R2. Great, so that's, that's our loop rule. That's kind of just exemplifying what that sum means. If we have multiple resistances, they just act, at least pair, like in series, consecutively, we'll talk about in a sec, they combine together. Um, so let's look at this and see if we can grab a little result, learn something about it. Here, I have the same current going through R1 and R2. Right? There's only one current flowing through this circuit, conservation of current. So all the current that goes through here has to go through here. And so that's why I have the same I. I don't need an I1, R1, I2, R2. There's just one value of current. So I can factor it out. Now I have an equation, E pump minus I times this value R1 plus R2. It looks a lot like, on the previous slide, my E pump minus IR, right? Except I subbed out R to just one resistance for the sum of the two resistances in the pipe. And that turns out to be a valuable result. If we have pipes with resistance or any sort, like resistances in series, that just means consecutively, one after another, all of the current has to go through all of the pieces. They're called in series. They just add together which I think makes good sense, right? If I'm water flowing through a circuit, I go through one pipe with resistance, that sucked away some energy density, I go through the next one, that sucked away some more. They just work additively. The more resistance pipe I go through, the higher the resistance. So why, did I, why do I care about this new value R series? Well, that's gonna help us describe the overall behavior of the circuit, right? If I'm current coming out of the pump, I can't tell the difference between R1 and R2 here separately or a single pipe with resistance R series or R1 plus R2. It all feels the same. It all takes away the same amount of energy density. So we'll explore that more in a sec, but what we're looking to do is take different configurations of resistance and simplify them. So what behavior does that cause in the circuit? So like we said, resistors, resistances in series add together. So let's look at something a little more complicated. What if we put them in parallel? Like I've shown here, parallel just means that you can go through either or, one resistor or the other. Um, so now, if we use our loop rule, we have two choices. Let's say we wanna start at three and go around I have to go through the pump, come down here, but now I have the choice. I can either go through R1 and then back to three, never touching R2, or go around, go through R2, never touching R1. So parallel, resistances are parallel when you can go through either one or the other. So when we do our loop rule, like I said, we have two choices. No matter what, we go through the pump, but then we can have a minus I1 R1 or a minus I2 R2. Key thing here, now my eyes are labeled. I have one eye for, that goes through R1 and one eye that goes through R2. Those do not have to be the same, but they do have some relationship that we'll talk about in a sec. But there's nothing that says that the current here has to be the same as the current here, right? Like if I'm, if I'm a bunch of water traveling through, some of me goes this way, some of me goes that way. There's no, there's no conservation that says how much has to go one way, has to, how much has to go the other, and they certainly are not both equal to this original I, right? All of this I has to split up somehow between I1 and I2. So restating what we just said, let's just focus on this bottom segment now. We're just gonna take a look at what's happening here. So we'll take, a, instead of going through the loop, we'll just go from point one to point two. So there's two answers for our change in pressure. Right, it's very simple, it's just either we go through the top, R1, or we go through the bottom. If we go through the top, we have minus I1, R1, we lose some pressure there, lose some energy density there, and this way we lose some energy density that's, uh, yeah, that may be different. However, can those two changes in pressure 
be different. We know that R1 and R2 don't have to be the same. And we said that I1 and I2 don't necessarily have to be the same. But do P, delta P1 and, sorry, does delta P12 for each have to be the same? I'm going to say yes, because if we think about what these expressions are saying, it's saying the change in pressure from this point to this point. And if we have two different answers for that, depending on whether I go through the top branch or the bottom, then I'll have two different answers for what the pressure is at two. Right, I go through this circuit, let's say 1.1 is at two atmospheres. Great, that's a single pressure. I can't have two answers for pressure here. Then if I went through I1, or sorry, went through R1, and I found that my change in pressure was one atmosphere, I lost one atmosphere, and now I'm down to one atmosphere at two. But then if I went through the bottom branch, and let's say I found my change in pressure was one and a half, now I'd get a different answer for two that would be 0.5 atmosphere, right? And I can't have two different answers for the same point. So just because of logic, for the fact that I have to, like, I have to be consistent with my answers for pressure at a single point, that tells us that when I go through parallel branches, I have to get the same change in pressure no matter what route I take. So again, the, the things that make it up, the things that are multiplied together, I and R, I1, R1, I2, R2, we don't know that those have to be equal, but their products, the overall pressure difference between them have to be equal. The other thing, so like that we kind of figured out just from logic, from the fact that we need consistent answers. The other thing, again, we call it the junction rule, but really it just comes from logic, is that our total current has to be made up of all of the currents that go into different branches. Or like it's, this is still an expression of conservation of current. Before, we had no branches. We just had single systems where the, all the fluid goes the exact same way. So in that case, yeah, I here equals I here equals I here. So we just said I1 equals I2, no matter what the points are. But now we have different sections of the circuit um, that can have different currents, because this current can split up. So kind of intuitively, we have I, the total current flowing through the circuit. And it has to split up between I1 and I2. So if we add I1 and I2 together, those have to total what my original current was. It's still conservation. All the current has to go somewhere. And then when they come back together, we haven't lost any. So it's still just accounting. We have some to spend, and we have to be consistent. So now if we take these two logical results, that when we have resistances in parallel, they have to have the same pressure difference, because we need consistent answers for the change, and that the current, the total current, has to be made up of all the subcurrent, the, you know, ch the different branch currents. I guess an easy way to say that is all the current in all the branches has to add up to the total. We can do some algebra, which these I'll put it up here, and the slides are available so you can work through. But it's not magic. It's just you know, substituting and moving stuff around. There's nothing more complicated than that. But all these results give us that the equivalent resistance of two resistors in parallel. So again, just like with the ones in series, if I want to combine them into just a single resistance that acts the same, that gives us the same current in the circuit as the two together, I need to use this equation. So whatever my R parallel that I want to substitute them needs to be equal to, well, one over that needs to equal one over R1 plus one over R2. For series, it was just R series is R1 plus R2. For parallel, it's this inverse something, a um, little bit of an uglier expression, uh, but it's going to have some cool results that we'll take a look at in a sec. Um, so you can see the top row, so maybe I should have mentioned this. I added, so we have minus I1 R1 equals minus I2 R2. That we already know. We just know those are the pressure changes. They need to be equal. I added a line or an equality there that's minus I R parallel. So what that means is I there is the total current. That's the I, that's I1 plus I2 times the equivalent resistance. So if I just took these two branches out and replaced them with a single one, then all of the current would flow through that single one. So that's why I have my new R parallel and my total current that I substituted in. So you kind of see, like, the reason we're doing this is to simplify it, right? We have this 
more complicated circuit, and if I just want to find what the current is, I need to know what does this combined resistance feel like to the pump. Um, like we said, when they're in parallel, they share delta P, and we have this expression for the equivalent resistance. So now, before we practice this, I'm going to make it a little tougher. We just learned this concept, and we're just going to swap out all of our notation. We're going to switch from fluids to electric circuits. But if hopefully, I mean, I'm going to break these, both these things down a lot more in, in the next few slides, but hopefully it's clear to you that they're extremely similar. On the left, for fluids, we have our total head. That's our budget, our energy density that we spend and you know, change different accounts as we flow through the circuit. And then we have different things that can add or subtract energy density, pumps and resistances. Same exact thing is true for electric circuits. We have some total head or energy density that we can spend. That's our budget throughout the circuit. Call it voltage. And we have things that can add and subtract from that, batteries and resistors. And all the math is, well, pretty much all the math is exactly the same. So let's break down the components of electric circuits here. Well, first of all, current. That's where we started with fluid circuits, so let's start there. Fluid circuits, we know that our current is how much fluid is flowing through the circuit per time, right? It's our flow rate. Same thing for electricity, except we don't measure electricity in volume, right? Fluid, we care about volume, how, like meters cubed or milliliters, something like that. For electricity, current, we measure charge. How much charge? How many electrons? Something like that. So our new units, instead of meters cubed per second, volume per second, that was our fluid flow rate, now we have coulombs per second. Coulombs are the unit of electrical charge. So simple sub, and that's also known as an amp ampere, a coulomb per second. So our current now is the flow of electrical charge. A annoying little detail um, is that, well, I guess it doesn't need to be annoying. In this class, current is the flow of positive charge. So we'll talk about batteries more in a sec, but whenever you see an electrical circuit, you know that current flows from the positive terminal to the negative terminal. We go plus to minus, and we say that's the flow of positive charge. We should know that in Real life, that's not actually what happens. In real life, electrons are the things that travel through. Electrons are way, way lighter and move around between atoms. The protons in nuclei don't actually travel through a wire. Um, it's the electrons. But for some reason, in physics, it's convention to say that electrical current is the flow of positive charge. And so it doesn't really affect any of the math except for there would be a minus sign in front of everything if we were using electrons. But uh, that's just something that you should keep in mind for later in life, that protons don't flow through circuits. Electrons do. Um, but anyway, in this class, flow of positive charge is what we're going to think about. And positive charge flows from plus to minus or from high potential to low potential, just like fluids did. We have a high voltage. That's our energy density and flows through, which might as well just mention that now. What is our energy density? It's voltage. So before, for fluids, energy density was how much energy is associated with this amount of fluid. So we have an energy per volume of fluid. Again, it's the same swap. Instead of measuring charge or electricity in volume, we measure it in charge. So instead of joules per meter cubed, we have joules per coulomb, which is also known as a volt. So that's our new energy density. That's our, instead of pressure, we have voltage. That's the energy density that we spend and gain throughout a circuit. Um, so I'm pretty sure with all these units that we're using for electric circuits, the only change you really need to make is anywhere where you would have meters cubed, sub in coulombs, because we're measuring charge instead of volume. So and that's pretty much the extent of the differences mathematically, except for the letters are different. Um, OK, so we have current. That's amps, the flow of electric charge, positive charge. We have energy density. That is the energy per each of those charges, or amount of charge that's flowing through our circuit. Um, we still have a delta as we go through. Um, and the same delta is between two points in space. So I could take any two points in a circuit and find the change in voltage in between them by looking at the things in between those two points, um, batteries and resistors that we'll talk about in a sec. Um, and same thing, we could do loops as well. So I want to find the voltage change 
between here and here, like across the resistor, I can do that. Or I can do the loop rule, or just go from this point all the way around back to the same point. And I know then that my delta V, my change in voltage, or my change in energy density, has to be zero. Because if I go from one point back to the same point, I have to get no change, right? So we'll, we'll practice all that in a sec. So what elements are there in a circuit? What can add energy density? What can take away? Um, we don't have to worry about potential energy density and kinetic now. Charge just has voltage, so it's almost like we just had pressure. We don't have all these other things. So total head is simpler. The left-hand side is just voltage. But the things that change voltage in a circuit are for now, we'll, we'll introduce other elements later, but for now, it's just gonna be batteries and resistors. Batteries are shown in a circuit diagram, these things here, by just like a short line and a long line, sometimes a short line, long line, short line, long line, but it doesn't really matter. Um, the short side is the negative terminal, and the long side is the positive one, as is labeled here, and like I said, current flows from positive to negative. So the, if you want to think about the flow through this circuit, like I've shown the arrow for I, our current is flowing clockwise. Positive charges are leaving this terminal of the battery with a high voltage, traveling around the circuit into the low voltage side of the battery. They're flowing from high to low voltage. The other element of a circuit that takes away energy density is a resistor. So resistors are shown by these little zigzags here. We're gonna use lots of those, combine them in all different ways. Um, the units of resistance are ohms. You can find what an ohm, you could figure out what it is for yourself if you took the units of resistance from fluid circuits and again swapped meters cubed per coulombs. Anyway, it's kind of a messy unit, but the key takeaway, or like the nice part about it, I guess, is that the energy density dissipated or taken away by resistors is also just minus IR. It's the exact same expression. The units of I and the units of R are different now. Again, it's the flow of charge and it's resistance based on that, but it's still just minus IR. And the symbol for the energy density added by the battery is epsilon. It's just like a curly E thing. Um, that gives us the voltage introduced by the battery. So that's like our E pump over volume for the battery. And just like with fluid circuits, you don't want to think of a pump doesn't add water to the circuit, and it doesn't make the water go faster. The same is true in a fluid circuit, or sorry, in an electrical circuit. A battery doesn't add charge. A battery doesn't make the charge move faster. It just adds energy density, right? You can think about the charges are flowing through the circuit, and the battery is giving each one more energy density to spend as it travels through. So these are our circuit elements, and we combine them in our new equation up here. This is like our Bernoulli equation just for electrical circuits. On the left, we have our changing voltage, our budget, and on the right, we have the sum of all the elements that add and subtract from it. So just like with fluid circuits, we have a loop rule, which is really just evaluating that equation in a loop, so the delta V has to go to zero, and this is going to be something that we use a lot. We certainly will still find like just the voltage difference between two different points in electric circuits, but the loop rule is a super, super valuable tool, and we'll use that a lot more than we did, um, if we ever really did, with fluid circuits. So here's just an example of applying that. No matter where I start in this circuit, it doesn't matter as long as I go in a full loop. Let's say I start at point four, I go through the battery, so I get a plus epsilon, nothing, 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 go through the resistor, I get a minus IR, and then back to the point where I started. So I get this very simple loop rule equation, which is just zero equals epsilon minus IR, which lets me solve for the current. And just like we solved, so now we're getting back to where we left off with our fluid circuits. I solve for the current in the electrical circuit, and it is a function of just how strong is the battery, how strong is the resistor. Bigger battery with the same resistor will give me more current, and a bigger resistor with a weaker battery will give me less current. It's harder for the battery to pump the charge through it. So I kind of just answered both these questions. So let's take a really short amount of time to answer these polls. In this circuit, what happens to the current if I double epsilon, if I double the voltage of the battery?
10 more seconds with this one. All right, I'll stop us there. So same equation, I'll start from the beginning, but if we really want to start with our loop rule, starting at any point in the circuit, delta V has to equal zero because we're going in a full loop, and we pick up an epsilon from the battery and a minus IR from the resistor, so we can solve for the current, just epsilon over R, and if I were to double epsilon, double the voltage of the battery, I double the resulting current. Okay. What's going to happen to the current if I double the resistance? So this one, even quicker. All right, I'll stop us there. So if we double the resistance, it will reduce to half. So same exact equation. Current is epsilon over R. If I double the resistance, make it harder for the charge to flow through, then I will have half the current. So I'll note here, and it's very important too, it seems like we don't have conservation of current. Right? I'm asking you all these things, what happens to the current? We'll say it's double, the current is halved. How does that keep in line with the fact that our current is conserved? Well, if I double the strength of the battery, or I double the strength of the resistor, I'm changing the circuit. It's a whole new circuit. So there's nothing that says that one circuit has to behave just like the other. I'm swapping it out. Um, so that's why this, none, none of this violates any of our principles. All right, so now I'm remembering this is really where we left off with fluid circuits, is combining these resistances. So it gets a little messy when we're talking about fluid circuits just because there's I don't know, it's, it's messy to draw. That's why these circuit diagrams are really nice. But we have the same conundrum come up a lot where it's not just, oh, this circuit has this resistance. That would be the easiest thing, right? Because we just saw when we have one battery and one resistance, it's very easy to see the behavior of the circuit. It's very easy to see what the current will be because it's just epsilon over R. But what do we do if we're left with a circuit that has a bunch of different resistors in it? We don't have an easy way to just figure out what the, the current is going to be. What resistance is the battery going to feel as a result of this whole web of resistors? Well, we already derived the rules for how to combine resistors into a single value um, with fluid circuits. And like I said, the math is the exact same, so we can just take our results from before and apply them. But before I put those back on the screen, I just want to remind us exactly like what we're doing, like what the point of simplifying the circuit is. We want to get, on the case here on the left, this is a series configuration. We have one resistor and then another consecutive with it. So all the current, here I labeled it as I total, that's coming out of the battery goes through R1 and R2. And so we want to combine them into a single equivalent resistor to see, well, yeah, well, that part's a little simpler to see. For the parallel configuration, we have some total current that then splits between R1 and R2. So but we, if we want to figure out how much of that current is split one way and how much is the other, we need to know what our original value was. We want to know what that I total is. So it's much better if we can combine R1 and R2 into one resistor that behaves the same way. That way we can easily solve for the total amount of current in the circuit and then work backwards. I'm saying a lot of this now, we'll have to like, do some problems to really get comfortable with it, but it's very helpful to combine a bunch of resistors into a single value. Um, okay, so same rules we found as before. When they're in series, consecutive, they just add R1 plus R2 because all the charge has to go through one, loses some energy density, then the next one loses some more. When they're in parallel, we have the same type of thing happen. The equation is the same. One over REQ equals one over R1 plus one over R2. Um, and so the current splits between those two and our equivalent resistance um, is a result. Yeah, so why don't we just go to the next slide. I'm gonna, before I break down what these equations imply, um, let's, let's do a clicker question. So 
I'm showing you the two equations for finding an R equivalent. And I'm saying if I have two 3 ohm resistors, if I put them in parallel, I'm saying they'll have a greater equivalent resistance than if I put them in series. Is that true or false? So two identical 3 ohm resistors, basically asking are they going to have a higher equivalent resistance if I stack them together in series or if I put them in two branches in parallel. Give you 10 more seconds or so. All right, you did a nice job with this one. So this first equation, I didn't label it before, but when we add them together, that's what we do for when they're in series, so one after the other. So we have two 3 ohm resistors in series. They act just like a single 6 ohm resistor, which makes sense, right? If I'm the charge going through, I put another one in front of the first one, I have to go through double the resistors, so I feel double the resistance. However, if we put them in parallel, if I'm a charge, now I can go through one branch or the other. So now when I complete the circuit, I can make it all the way around still only seeing one of those resistors. So it's not as difficult for me to get through as it is if they were stacked together. And what's more than that, it's actually even easier for me to get through the circuit because not only do I only have to go through one of these, but half of the other, or in this case half because the resistors are equal, but some, no matter what, some of the rest of the charge can go the other way. So not only do I only have to go through three ohms myself, but that load is lessened. So like, again, think of people like going through different hallways together. If everyone has to go through the same hallway, it's going to be harder to get through there. If we open up another hallway that branches off from it and people can split to both, even though the hallway is the same width as it was before, it's now easier to go through because less people are trying to get through at the same time. Same thing is, through for, is, is true for charges when they're going through resistors in parallel. Now there's more options, and so I'm making it easier for all of the charge to get through. So mathematically, if we plug that in, 1 over REQ is 1 over R1 plus 1 over R2. So we have 1 over 3 ohms plus 1 over 3 ohms, and we get 2 thirds inverse ohms, which this is a point when people often make mistakes. It's very common, especially when you're rushing on a quiz, so just make sure to not make this mistake as much as you can. You have, once you get that, you have to flip it. Right, because 1 over REQ equals 2 thirds of an inverse ohm. If I actually want REQ, this is the resistance I'm looking for, I have to do 1 over 2 thirds, so 3 halves of an ohm. So actually, by putting these two 3 ohm resistors in parallel, the equivalent resistance went down by half. Right, so I, I, I added resistance to the circuit, but the equivalent resistance went down. And that's actually always going to be true. No, we'll see specific cases, and you'll, you'll play with those in FNTs and in DL. But no matter what, if I have a circuit with a resistor or any amount of resistors, and I add another resistor in parallel with another one, my total, my equivalent resistance will always go down. Because no matter how big that resistor that I'm adding is, it could be have a million ohm resistor that's super super difficult for charge to get through, even though I add that into the circuit. If it's in parallel, I'm still lightening the load from another one. So let's say I just have a circuit, it's a battery, and a 3 ohm resistor. Charge is flowing through it, whatever. And then I add this a million ohm resistor in parallel to the 3 ohm one. Not much, it turn, you'll, you'll prove this yourself, but not much of that charge is going to opt to go through the million ohm resistor, right? You've probably heard the term like path of least resistance. 
And that's pretty much true. Very few charges are going to decide to. But maybe a couple will. And just the fact that it has that option, a few charges can go through this very difficult route, will lighten the load on the three ohm resistor. So even though I have a three ohm resistor and a million ohm resistor in parallel, the equivalent resistance is actually going to be lower than three. It's always going to be, when they're in parallel, the equivalent resistance is always going to be lower than the lowest value of the resistors that are in parallel. So that, that's a rule that you don't need to memorize. You'll see it, you'll see it play out a bunch, but I think it's kind of cool. Um, so anyway, getting back to the original question, it is false. Two three ohm resistors in parallel will actually have a smaller equivalent resistance than them in series because again you're lightening the load, spreading it out. Um, so the next bunch of I'm not sure exactly how many DLs, which DLs, but a lot of the work you'll be doing in the next week or so will be taking circuits with a bunch of different combinations of parallel and series resistors, more complicated than this. But at the end of the day, your goal is going to be to take a complicated circuit, condense it down into a single equivalent resistance, so you can solve just, oh, what is the current coming out of the battery? Like, I have this huge web of resistors, but what resistance does that feel like? What amount of current's gonna flow through them? And then once you simplify it, then you can work backwards and find the amount of current that divvies itself up in between each individual branch. Um, so that we're not gonna get into today, but that's where we're, we're headed. And now we have the tools to do so. It'll just be problem solving and practice from here on out. One more thing we're gonna introduce um, with electrical circuits, but that could apply for fluid circuits as well or any sort of fluid flow, flow scenario is power dissipation. So, so far we've talked about current and energy density, right? Current is our charge, or char yeah, in this case, charge per time, how much charge is flowing, and energy density, which is how much energy does each charge have. So if we multiply them together, energy per charge times charge per time, we get energy per unit time, which is power. So it's telling us, regardless of what's flowing through the circuit, whether it's water carrying energy density, some volume of water carrying some energy density, or some amount of charge carrying some energy density, we want to know how much energy is traveling through my circuit. That's what power is. And in electrical circuits, that's a very useful thing to know. I want to know how much power can this circuit deliver to maybe an appliance or something like that. And that's something that you'll explore on an FNT a little bit. Um, so if we want to find the power dissipated or introduced in an electric circuit, um, like we said here, like kind of just proved using units, we need to multiply our current by our voltage. So voltage times current, that gives us power. Um, the things that introduce power so that pump energy, like over time pump energy into a circuit are batteries. That's like our pump. They introduce energy to the circuit. So for that, our voltage times current. Voltage, again, is just this epsilon. If you have a one and a half volt battery, epsilon is one and a half volts times the current that's going through the circuit. The more current that flows through the circuit, the more current that flows through the same battery, the more power, right? Because you're giving the charge one and a half volts, and so the more charge that you send through, the more total power you're transferring, um, right? So there's your power for the battery, and then the power dissipated by the resistor, right? So you have power introduced by batteries and then power dissipated, energy is dissipated by the resistor, is the same, equal to voltage times current, except for a re resistor, the voltage change is whatever the delta V is for that. So we know that's IR, right? So that's why we have a few expressions for the power dissipated in the resistor. A battery, you're just given, it's epsilon. That's the voltage of the battery. But for a resistor, the voltage difference across it depends on the current of the circuit. So all these expressions are equivalent, like they, they'll give you the same answer, but we could sub in for delta V, IR, that's how we get I times IR equals I squared R, or we could plug in for I, delta V over R, remember we solved for the current across a resistor is the voltage change across it, divided by the resistance, or in the case we did before, it's the voltage of the battery across the resistance, divided by the resistance, sorry. Either way, that turns into delta V squared over R. You can never choose wrong. Like, 
as long as you're inserting the right values into these expressions for a resistor, these will all give you the same answer. It just kind of boils down to convenience. If I already have the current and the resistance, then I should probably use the expression that only requires those two things. But it's only a, a very quick step, like for some reason, let's say I really wanted to use this expression, but I only had the current and resistance. Turns out delta V is just current times resistance. So I could just plug that in here. So the worst thing you can do is waste a little bit of time, but you should get the right answer no matter which expression you use. So let's do a quick example with power dissipation. First circuit on the left, as simple as it can be, I have a battery going through a resistor, which now I've shown as a light bulb. So I use kind of those inter interchangeably. The zigzag is just a ideal like resistor. You'll play with them in DL a little bit, but their only purpose is to add resistance. There's a bunch of uses for that, but they turn this energy, they dissipate it by getting hot. So it turns the energy density that the charge has into heat. But anyway, we can also have a light bulb. Instead of turning it into a heat, turns it into light energy. Either way, it's taking charge away from the circuit and dissipating it as something else. Light bulbs also heat up a bit, so maybe those are thermal energy and light. Regardless, let's find the power dissipated by this light bulb. So like with almost all electric circuit problems, we're gonna start with our loop rule. For this circuit, it's the exact same as the one we saw with just a battery and a resistor, because that's what it is. Going in any loop you take, you get a plus epsilon and a minus IR. And that lets us solve for the current, right? We move IR to the other side, divide by R, and we get our current is just equal to epsilon over R. And so to solve for the power, like I said before, I have current and I have my value of resistance. So it makes the most sense for me to use the expression for power dissipation that uses those two things. Plug in I, plug in R, and I get this expression for the power dissipated by the light bulb. So that, again, the units of power are energy per time, so that means that over time, the light bulb is dissipating some energy, and this is the expression for that. Um, how much of that voltage is being turned into light. Now let's do the same for a little bit more of a complex circuit. Now I have two of the same light bulbs still with resistance R, except they're hooked up in parallel. So let's do our loop rule again. Um, so I guess I'm kind of skipping a step. We can't do our, well we can do our loop rule, right? But we have two choices, right? I can either go through the top light bulb or the bottom light bulb, and both of those are valid. The tricky part is they both have different currents, right? There's some I total, that's the same no matter what, coming out of the battery. I have one value for current and one wire, but then it splits up going through the two light bulbs. So like I said, the easiest thing to do with these is often to simplify it into an equivalent resistance. And then if you wanna work backwards, you can. But to find that I total, the total current going through, um, let's simplify the circuit. Whoops. Right, so now we want, instead of this two loop rule deal, we just want an I total equal to a epsilon over REQ. So essentially we want to simplify that to this circuit, something that looks just like this circuit, except whatever the value of R will be, won't just be R, it will be whatever the equivalent resistance of those two in parallel is. So let's use our expression for REQ. It's just one over R plus one over R, it's one over REQ. And if we solve that for REQ, it turns out that, just like we found with the three ohm resistors, we get a value that's equal to one half of the original. It's not always gonna be one half when you combine things in parallel, it just happens when they are the exact same value. If the resistors were different values and we combine them in parallel, the value wouldn't just be a clean one half. But here it is. So now we have our equivalent resistance and we have our total current based on that equivalent resistance. And so that means that our total current is two epsilon over R. So right away we found something cool, that the equivalent resistance is half and as a result, the total current is double what it was when we just had a single light bulb. So I added a light bulb in parallel to this one and that increased the current because now it's easier for the charge to flow through. So now more charge is gonna flow through, in fact, twice as much. And now we have our total current and our equivalent resistance so we can find the power dissipated using the same expression 
except now we're plugging in I total and REQ, and we find that the power dissipation is two epsilon squared over R, or double what we found for the single light bulb. So practically what that means is if you have a battery hooked up to a light bulb, let's say it runs for a half an hour before the battery is dead, right? And what that means is essentially the, bow the, the battery has a certain amount of energy stored in it. Power tells you how much energy per second is being pumped out by the battery, and so it's going to run out at a certain amount of time. So in this case, if it took a half hour, we know when we hook two light bulbs across it in series that there's going to be twice the amount of power dissipation. So that battery is now going to be pumping twice as much energy per second in. So if it lasted 30 minutes there, it's go only going to last 15 minutes here. So there's a lot more that you can extract from this. Like the, I mean, I just kind of glossed over this, but why can I just plug in I total and REQ here? It's because this circuit, we simplified into something like this. Anyway, th you're going to need to take a couple steps back, and you'll work with that in DL, and kind of work on these problems from the ground up um, and learn a lot along the way. But now you have pretty much all the tools you need um, to work with electric circuits, um, at least with just batteries and resistors. Um, first priority, though, is fluid circuits. Um, that's going to be your quiz next week, which will be at the start of class. If you do plan on leaving after the quiz, um, that's fine, but just try to minimally interrupt the people that are still taking it. Also, please get here a couple minutes early. That way we can just flip over the quizzes and start at 9 on the dot, if you were just going to show up for that. Um, thanks, and I'll see you next week.